Chapter Thirty Nine of Vanity Fair by William Thackeray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Helen Taylor. Chapter Thirty Nine, a cynical chapter. Our duty now takes us back for a brief space to some old Hampshire acquaintances of ours, whose hopes respecting the disposal of their rich kinswoman's property were so woefully disappointed after counting upon thirty thousand pounds from his sister it was a heavy blow to bute crawley to receive but five out of which sum when he had paid his own debts and those of jim his son at college a very small fragment remained to portion off his four plain daughters mrs bute never knew or at least never acknowledged how far her own tyrannous behaviour had tended to ruin her husband all that woman could do she vowed and protested she had done was it her fault if she did not possess those sycophantic arts which her hypocritical nephew pitt crawley practised she wished him all the happiness which he merited out of his ill-gotten gains at least the money will remain in the family she said charitably pitt will never spend it my dear that is quite certain for a greater miser does not exist in england and he is as odious though in a different way as his spendthrift brother the abandoned rawdon so mrs bute after the first shock of rage and disappointment began to accommodate herself as best she could to her altered fortunes and to save and retrench with all her might she instructed her daughters how to bear poverty cheerfully and invented a thousand notable methods to conceal or evade it she took them about to balls and public places in the neighbourhood with praiseworthy energy nay she entertained her friends in a hospitable comfortable manner at the rectory and much more frequently than before dear miss crawley's legacy had fallen in from her outward bearing nobody would have supposed that the family had been disappointed in their expectations or have guessed from her frequent appearance in public how she pinched and starved at home her girls had more milliners furniture than they had ever enjoyed before they appeared perseveringly at the winchester and southampton assemblies they penetrated to cows for the race balls and regatta gaieties there and their carriage with the horses taken from the plough was at work perpetually until it began almost to be believed that the four sisters had had fortunes left them by their aunt whose name the family never mentioned in public but with the most tender gratitude and regard i know no sort of lying which is more frequent in vanity fair than this and it may be remarked how people who practise it take credit to themselves for their hypocrisy and fancy that they are exceedingly virtuous and praiseworthy because they are able to deceive the world with regard to the extent of their means mrs bute certainly thought herself one of the most virtuous women in england and the sight of her happy family was an edifying one to strangers they were so cheerful so loving so well educated so simple martha painted flowers exquisitely and furnished half the charity bazaars in the county emma was a regular county bulbul and her verses in the hampshire telegraph were the glory of its poet's corner fanny and matilda sang duets together mamma playing the piano and the other two sisters sitting with their arms round each other's waists and listening affectionately nobody saw the poor girls drumming at the duets in private no one saw mamma drilling them rigidly hour after hour in a word mrs bute put a good face against fortune and kept up appearances in the most virtuous manner everything that a good and respectable mother could do mrs bute did she got over yachting men from southampton parsons from the cathedral close at winchester 
and officers from the barracks there she tried to inveigle the young barristers at assizes and encouraged jim to bring home friends with whom he went out hunting with the h h what will not a mother do for the benefit of her beloved ones between such a woman and her brother-in-law the odious baronet at the hall it is manifest that there could be very little in common the rupture between bute and his brother sir pitt was complete indeed between sir pitt and the whole county to which the old man was a scandal his dislike for respectable society increased with age and the lodge gates had not opened to a gentleman's carriage wheels since pitt and lady jane came to pay their visit of duty after their marriage that was an awful and unfortunate visit never to be thought of by the family without horror pitt begged his wife with a ghastly countenance never to speak of it and it was only through mrs bute herself who still knew everything which took place at the hall that the circumstances of sir pitt's reception of his son and daughter-in-law were ever known at all as they drove up the avenue of the park in their neat and well-appointed carriage pitt remarked with dismay and wrath great gaps among the trees his trees which the old baronet was felling entirely without licence the park wore an aspect of utter dreariness and ruin the drives were ill-kept and the neat carriage splashed and floundered in muddy pools along the road the great sweep in front of the terrace and entrance stair was black and covered with mosses the once trim flower-beds rank and weedy shutters were up along almost the whole line of the house the great hall door was unbarred after much ringing of the bell an individual in ribbons was seen flitting up the black oak stair as horrocks at length admitted the heir of queen's crawley and his bride into the halls of their fathers he led the way into sir pitt's library as it was called the fumes of tobacco growing stronger as pitt and lady jane approached that apartment sir pitt ain't very well horrocks remarked apologetically and hinted that his master was afflicted with lumbago the library looked out on the front walk and park sir pitt had opened one of the windows and was bawling out thence to the postilion and pitt's servant who seemed to be about to take the baggage down don't move none of them trunks he cried pointing with a pipe which he held in his hand it's only a morning visit tucker you fool lor what cracks that off hoss has in his heels ain't there no one at the king's head to rub em a little how do pitt how do my dear come to see the old man eh gad you've a pretty face too you ain't like that old horse godmother your mother come and give old pitt a kiss like a good little gal the embrace disconcerted the daughter-in-law somewhat as the caresses of the old gentleman unshorn and perfumed with tobacco might well do but she remembered that her brother southdown had mustachios and smoked cigars and submitted to the baronet with a tolerable grace pitt has got fat said the baronet after this mark of affection does he read e very long sermons my dear under at psalm every evening eh pitt go and get a glass of malmsey and a cake for my lady jane horrocks you great big booby and don't stand steer in there like a fat pig i won't ask you to stop my dear you'll find it too stupid and so should i too along a pit i'm an old man now and i like my own ways and my pipe and backgammon of a night i can play at backgammon sir said lady jane laughing i used to play with papa and miss crawley didn't i mr crawley lady jane can play sir at the game to which you state that you are so partial pitt said haughtily but she won't stop for all that no no go back to mudbury and give mrs rincer a benefit 
or drive down to the rectory and ask beauty for a dinner he'll be charmed to see you you know he's so much obliged to you for getting the old woman's money <laughs> some of it will do to patch up the oar when i'm gone i perceive sir said pitt with a heightened voice that your people will cut down the timber yes yes very fine weather and seasonable for the time of year sir pitt answered who had suddenly grown deaf but i'm getting old pitt now lord bless ye ye ain't far from fifty yourself but he wears well my pretty lady jane don't he it's all godliness sobriety and a moral life look at me i'm not very far from fourscore <laughs> and he laughed and took snuff and leered at her and pinched her hand pitt once more brought the conversation back to the timber but the baronet was deaf again in an instant i'm getting very old and i've been cruel bad this year with the lumbago i shan't be here now for long but i'm glad you've come daughter-in-law i like your face lady jane it's got none of the damned eye-boned binky look in it and i'll give ye something pretty my dear to go to court in and he shuffled across the room to a cupboard from which he took a little old case containing jewels of some value take that said he my dear it belonged to my mother and afterwards to the first lady binky pretty pearls never gave em the ironmonger's daughter no no take em and put em up quick said he thrusting the case into his daughter's hand and clapping the door of the cabinet to as horrocks entered with a salver and refreshments what have you been and given pitt's wife said the individual in ribbons when pitt and lady jane had taken leave of the old gentleman it was miss horrocks the butler's daughter the cause of the scandal throughout the county the lady who reigned now almost supreme at queen's crawley the rise and progress of those ribbons had been marked with dismay by the county and family the ribbons opened an account at the mudbury branch savings bank the ribbons drove to church monopolising the pony chaise which was for the use of the servants at the hall the domestics were dismissed at her pleasure the scotch gardener who still lingered on the premises taking a pride in his walls and hot-houses and indeed making a pretty good livelihood by the garden which he farmed and of which he sold the produce at southampton found the ribbons eating peaches on a sunshiny morning at the south wall and had his ears boxed when he remonstrated about this attack on his property he and his scotch wife and his scotch children the only respectable inhabitants of queen's crawley were forced to migrate with their goods and their chattels and left the stately comfortable gardens to go to waste and the flower-beds to run to seed poor lady crawley's rose-garden became the dreariest wilderness only two or three domestics shuddered in the bleak old servants hall the stables and offices were vacant and shut up and half ruined sir pitt lived in private and boozed nightly with horrocks his butler or house steward as he now began to be called and the abandoned ribbons the times were very much changed since the period when she drove to mudbury in the spring cart and called the small tradesman sir it may have been shame or it may have been dislike of his neighbours but the old cynic of queen's crawley hardly issued from his park gates at all now he quarrelled with his agents and screwed his tenants by letter his days were passed in conducting his own correspondence the lawyers and farm bailiffs who had to do business with him could not reach him but through the ribbons who received them at the door of the housekeeper's room which commanded the back entrance by which they were admitted and so the baronet's daily perplexities increased and his embarrassments multiplied around him the horror of pitt crawley may be imagined 
as these reports of his father's dotage reached the most exemplary and correct of gentlemen he trembled daily lest he should hear that the ribbons was proclaimed his second legal mother-in-law after that first and last visit his father's name was never mentioned in pitt's polite and genteel establishment it was the skeleton in his house and all the family walked by it in terror and silence the countess southdown kept on dropping per coach at the lodge gate the most exciting tracts tracts which ought to frighten the hair off your head mrs bute at the parsonage nightly looked out to see if the sky was red over the elms behind which the hall stood and the mansion was on fire sir g wapshot and sir h foddleston old friends of the house wouldn't sit on the bench with sir pitt at quarter sessions and cut him dead in the high street of southampton where the reprobate stood offering his dirty old hands to them nothing had any effect upon him he put his hands into his pockets and burst out laughing as he scrambled into his carriage and four he used to burst out laughing at lady southdown's tracts and he laughed at his sons and at the world and at the ribbons when she was angry which was not seldom miss horrocks was installed as housekeeper at queen's crawley and ruled all the domestics there with great majesty and rigour all the servants were instructed to address her as mum or madam and there was one little maid on her promotion who persisted in calling her my lady without any rebuke on the part of the housekeeper there has been better ladies and there has been worse sir hester was miss horrocks reply to this compliment of her inferior so she ruled having supreme power over all except her father whom however she treated with considerable haughtiness warning him not to be too familiar in his behaviour to one as was to be a baronet's lady indeed she rehearsed that exalted part in life with great satisfaction to herself and to the amusement of old sir pitt who chuckled at her airs and graces and would laugh by the hour together at her assumptions of dignity and imitations of genteel life he swore it was as good as a play to see her in the character of a fine dame and he made her put on one of the first lady crawley's court dresses swearing entirely to miss horrocks's own concurrence that the dress became her prodigiously and threatening to drive her off that very instant to court in a coach and four she had the ransacking of the wardrobes of the two defunct ladies and cut and hacked their posthumous finery so as to suit her own tastes and figure and she would have liked to take possession of their jewels and trinkets too but the old baronet had locked them away in his private cabinet nor could she coax or wheedle him out of the keys and it is a fact that some time after she left queen's crawley a copy-book belonging to this lady was discovered which showed that she had taken great pains in private to learn the art of writing in general and especially of writing her own name as lady crawley lady betsy horrocks lady elizabeth crawley etc though the good people of the parsonage never went to the hall and shunned the horrid old dotard its owner yet they kept a strict knowledge of all that happened there and were looking out every day for the catastrophe for which miss horrocks was also eager but fate intervened enviously and prevented her from receiving the reward due to such immaculate love and virtue one day the baronet surprised her ladyship as he jocularly called her seated at that old and tuneless piano in the drawing-room which had scarcely been touched since becky sharp played quadrilles upon it seated at the piano with the utmost gravity and squalling to the best of her power 
in imitation of the music which she had sometimes heard the little kitchen-maid on her promotion was standing at her mistress's side quite delighted during the operation and wagging her head up and down and crying lord mum tis beautiful just like a genteel sycophant in a real drawing-room this incident made the old baronet roar with laughter as usual he narrated the circumstance a dozen times to horrocks in the course of the evening and greatly to the discomfiture of miss horrocks he thrummed on the table as if it had been a musical instrument and squalled in imitation of her manner of singing he vowed that such a beautiful voice ought to be cultivated and declared she ought to have singing masters in which proposals she saw nothing ridiculous he was in great spirits that night and drank with his friend and butler an extraordinary quantity of rum and water at a very late hour the faithful friend and domestic conducted his master to his bedroom half an hour afterwards there was a great hurry and bustle in the house lights went about from window to window in the lonely desolate old hall whereof but two or three rooms were ordinarily occupied by its owner presently a boy on a pony went galloping off to mudbury to the doctor's house there and in another hour by which fact we ascertain how carefully the excellent mrs bute crawley had always kept up an understanding with the great house the lady in her clogs and calash the reverend bute crawley and james crawley her son had walked over from the rectory through the park and had entered the mansion by the open hall door they passed through the hall and into the small oak parlour on the table of which stood the three tumblers and the empty rum bottle which had served for sir pitt's carouse and through that apartment into sir pitt's study where they found miss horrocks of the guilty ribbons with a wild air trying at the presses and escritoires with a bunch of keys she dropped them with a scream of terror as little mrs bute's eyes flashed out at her from under the black calash look at that james and mr crawley cried mrs bute pointing at the scared figure of the black-eyed guilty wench he gave em me he gave em me she cried gave them you you abandoned creature screamed mrs bute bear witness mr crawley we found this good-for-nothing woman in the act of stealing your brother's property and she will be hanged as i always said she would betsy horrocks quite daunted flung herself down on her knees bursting into tears but those who know a really good woman are aware that she is not in a hurry to forgive and that the humiliation of an enemy is a triumph to her soul ring the bell james mrs bute said go on ringing it till the people come the three or four domestics resident in the deserted old house came presently at that jangling and continued summons put that woman in the strong room she said we caught her in the act of robbing sir pitt mr crawley you'll make out her committal and beddoes you'll drive her over in the spring cart in the morning to southampton jail my dear imposed the magistrate and rector she's only are there no handcuffs mrs bute continued stamping in her clogs there used to be handcuffs where's the creature's abominable father he did give em me still cried poor betsy didn't he hester you saw sir pitt you know you did gave em me ever so long ago the day after mudbury fair not that i want em take em if you think they ain't mine and here the unhappy wretch pulled out from her pocket a large pair of paste shoe buckles which had excited her admiration and which she had just appropriated out of one of the bookcases in the study where they had lain law betsy how could you go for to tell such a wicked story said hester the little kitchen-maid late on her promotion 
and to madam crawley so good and kind and his reverence with a curtsey and you may search all my boxes ma'am i'm sure and here's my keys as i'm an honest girl though of poor parents and workhouse bred and if you find so much as a beggarly bit of lace or silk stocking out of all the gowns as you've had the picking of may i never go to church again give up your keys you hardened hussy hissed out the virtuous little lady in the calash and here's a candle mum and if you please mum i can show you her room mum and the press and the housekeeper's room mum where she keeps heaps and heaps of things mum cried out the eager little hester with a profusion of curtsies hold your tongue if you please i know the room which the creature occupies perfectly well mrs brown have the goodness to come with me and beddoes don't you lose sight of that woman said mrs bute seizing the candle mr crawley you had better go upstairs and see that they are not murdering your unfortunate brother and the calash escorted by mrs brown walked away to the apartment which as she said truly she knew perfectly well bute went upstairs and found the doctor from mudbury with the frightened horrocks over his master in a chair they were trying to bleed sir pitt crawley with the early morning an express was sent off to mr pitt crawley by the rector's lady who assumed the command of everything and had watched the old baronet through the night he had been brought back to a sort of life he could not speak but seemed to recognise people mrs bute kept resolutely by his bedside she never seemed to want to sleep that little woman and did not close her fiery black eyes once though the doctor snored in the armchair horrocks made some wild efforts to assert his authority and assist his master but mrs bute called him a tipsy old wretch and bade him never show his face again in that house or he should be transported like his abominable daughter terrified by her manner he slunk down to the oak parlour where mr james was who having tried the bottle standing there and found no liquor in it ordered mr horrocks to get another bottle of rum which he fetched with clean glasses and to which the rector and his son sat down ordering horrocks to put down the keys at that instant and never to show his face again cowed by this behaviour horrocks gave up the keys and he and his daughter slunk off silently through the night and gave up possession of the house of queen's crawley End of chapter thirty nine